Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. COVID-19. Before we start, a question that we often receive is why we don't wear masks in this indoor setting. So I would like to use the opportunity to clarify what is the WHO guidance once again when we are in indoor setting and apart from each other more than one meter, we uh, don't need to wear masks. But if, if we are in a crowded place and sitting too close to each other, then we should, we should wear a mask. Um, you can also find all our guidances on our website. And before I hand over the floor to Mike and Maria, I would invite us all to ask your questions on Twitter using the hashtag AskWHO and on other platforms via comment section. Good afternoon, Mike, Maria. Thank you for being with us again and finding the time to answer the questions from, from the public. Um, how, before we receive some questions, would you tell us how does your day look like during this pandemic? How your work day is today? Um, well, uh, days are, are quite busy. They start quite early with us. And um, we normally begin our day with um, a meeting of the incident management support team, which is essentially where all the different pillars come together and say where we are, what are the priorities of the day, what are the things that everybody needs to know about. Um, and then following that, it's an hour every morning, and then following that we have what we call our, our morning meeting, um, where we discuss all or any acute events that are taking place worldwide. So these are outbreaks or humanitarian situations that are occurring uh, wherever they may occur and we discuss them as a, as a group to see what is the latest that we know, what support can WHO provide and, and, and um, that's every day. So there are many uh, events that happen beyond COVID so we have uh, many teams that are looking out for what those, those events may be. And then the rest of the day is a series of meetings that we have um, with partners, um, with our international networks of technicians and scientists and public health professionals. Um, we convene lots of different groups and we meet virtually through either teleconferences or video conferences. Um, so a series of meetings and then in between there we read, we write, uh, we review, um, we try to have some lunch in there if we can and have a little coffee, a little food. Um, but every day is very dynamic. Um, it's very interactive with not only people within WHO in headquarters but in our regions but also globally so we are very very fortunate that we work with incredible partners globally um, and we and we bring them all together through different types of teleconferences thank you Maria you mentioned that on daily basis you're in touch with a network of scientists and technicians and experts and I remember last week we, towards the end we received a question that we didn't address um, how can we better communicate uh, science and slow nature of, of scientific processes uh, rapidly to adapt them into policies and behaviors that we need public to take now during the pandemic? So that's a great question, and sorry we didn't get to it the last time. Um, I actually think that the science in this pandemic and for this pathogen is happening incredibly fast um, and remarkably fast. If you think about it, we're seven months into a new virus, a new pathogen that we knew nothing about before. Um, and the entire global community of researchers and frontline workers have come together to conduct studies um, which help us better understand how this virus behaves, who it infects, how it's transmitted, the diseases that it causes, what types of interventions can be used. Um, we tried to consolidate, bring together all of the science through our teleconferences um, where we bring uh, people speaking directly to one another um, which is faster than any peer-reviewed publication can happen. Mm -hmm. It's faster than any report that can be generated. And then we work with our teams mm -hmm. and with our international networks to consolidate that into guidance. So we, our first package of guidance was issued on January 10th, 11th, and 12th. So that was 10 days, 11 days, 12 days, within two weeks of when we first heard about this cluster. So that was incredibly fast. And we've been working ever since to incorporate new guidance into that. But it's really been remarkable uh, how fast all of this has happened. Mike and I and the Director General and our Chief Scientists and many people across uh, our regions try to communicate what we know about it through press conferences, through these Facebook Lives, um, through different Q&As. Um, we try to do that as often as we can. 
Um, but not only what we know, but the uncertainty around what we know. And I know that can be confusing to some people. Um, but we're really working hard to even push everybody to work even faster and do really high quality research so that can inform our guidance. Thank you, Maria. Um, and for explaining as well all the efforts that you, Dr. Mike Ryan and Director General and other experts are putting as well to inform public timely of, on everything we know and we still need to learn about. So, Dr. Mike Ryan, how does your day look like as <coughs> WHO Chief of Emergencies? Mm -hmm. What she said. <laughs> 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 um, no, it's obviously the same kind of diversity. Um, uh, I think so many of our staff have been working seven days a week for seven months. Um, so it is, it, there is the plan and then there's a the day you have. I think we all know that one, right? <laughs> Uh, so uh, today be a fairly typical day, you know, starting with the the morning meetings. But then I would have gone in to meet uh, uh, Walid uh, Obidat, the ambassador from Jordan, and then straight into a global teleconference on the Solidarity Fund because we've received over two hundred and fifteen million dollars through the UN Solidar the the, uh, the the Solidarity Fund for COVID nineteen. Thank you all. Many of you and out there have made contributions to that, both uh, individual citizens and and uh, uh, private sector <coughs> donors, and it's made a huge difference. And that's allowed us to invest in research. It's allowed us to invest in protecting refugees through HCR. It's allowed us to invest in uh, research and development. It's allowed us to invest in training and so many other things. And it's really added value. Uh, and we have to meet. Uh, we meet every week to go through how those projects are going, how the money is being spent. <coughs> just to ensure that we're getting good value for money for all of you who uh, 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 took out your precious dollars and yen and yuan and uh, euros and, uh, and, and uh, shillings and, and everything else to, uh, to support this. Um, but then, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge is the shifting your, your brain between things. It's a bit like those, uh, those of you who are watching who were uh, in secondary school, you know, it's like going from geography class to to maths class to English class and then religion class or whatever else it is and your brain is by the mid-afternoon uh, you don't know uh, where you are. Uh, I went straight in a after that to a, a global meeting on contact tracing and how we work on that and I'm also the chair of the UN crisis management team so we have 23 UN organizations working together. Um, we meet again on a weekly basis, I chair that and Today we were discussing the uh, Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. We were discussing the new policies from the um, UN agencies on schools reopening. And we were uh, discussing the preparations for the next G20 meeting on global preparedness. So, And then into uh, a meeting preparing for the IHR Emergency Committee, which is happening on Friday. Um, and then another teleconference uh, with some logistics experts from around the world looking at how we're going to be able to scale up our supply chain in the coming months because we're going from supplying millions of diagnostic kits to potentially hundreds of millions of diagnostic kits. We're going from having no COVID vaccine to potentially having two or three billion doses of vaccine. We've got to be able to buy that, ship it, move it safely, and we need to start planning for that now. So that was my day, and I'm here now. <coughs> Thank you very We're much. Finished. Thank yes. you very much for your time. <laughs> I, I would just like to stress that COVID is not the only emergency that you are overseeing and the WHO is responding to. We, ha we still have Ebola in DRC and other humanitarian crises. So you're, I'm sure you have a lot more meetings on, on these emergencies as well. I was just giving you the COVID ones. The so COVID ones, can, yes. We can do the Libya one and we can do the Syria one and the Yemen one. And I think that's a, it's a very good point, Alex, because we cannot forget mm -hmm that there are literally hundreds of millions of people around the world who are you know, already <laughs> suffering huge issues of food insecurity, um, conflict, lack of access to health services, and uh, we have to keep our eye on, on ensuring that we continue to serve them. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. You also mentioned IHR, International Health Regulations, and the Emergency Committee that meets on Friday. But mm -hmm. tomorrow we are marking six, six months since we declare public health emergency of international concern. Um, what, how, that's the highest al alarm that WHO can raise mm -hmm. for emergency. Uh, how do we raise that alarm, and why does it matter? Um, the... 
The international health regulations is, in, in a sense, is the international law around epidemics and emergencies. And it was entirely revised in, the, in 2005 to three years. And governments from all around the world and people say that uh, the WHO and IHR are the same. Well, in fact, the IHR was negotiated by our member states. Mm -hmm. 194 countries came together and they said, OK, how are we going to manage epidemics together? And what are the rules going to be? <coughs> and they spent three years negotiating that. Uh, it came into force in 2007. And it's been 13 years that we've had this new and revised IHR. We've only declared four public health emergencies, uh, global public health emergencies, in that time. So it shows you that the WHO doesn't declare global public health emergencies every day. <clears throat> Where we have, uh, right now, today, we have 33 emergencies around the world, but they're operational emergencies, things that are bad, uh, and they require us to respond, but they're not uh, considered... Uh, by the global community as global public health emergencies that require this collective action at global level. Uh, the first one that met those criteria was the pandemic of 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think that's the, the essence of the IHR, is when the IHR Emergency Committee uh, gets together and that is selected from a whole series of representatives that are suggested by our member states. They get together, we brief them on the existing emergency, they come to a determination of whether that event meets the criteria that represent a global public health emergency and they advise the Director General of that and on the 30th of uh, January they declared um, uh, they advised the DG that this was uh, a global public health emergency and in that sense that's a call the action because that's essentially saying to the world this was an emergency but now we are giving this a completely different status we are saying collectively globally this represents a threat to the world um, and uh, uh, and in that sense it should generate a and it, and it has in the past generated a massive response uh, I think in in this case we did see a response to the declaration on January 30th but I'd have to say that the overall response to that massive alert was less than it should have been overall. And I think uh, uh, we all need to look at that. Why did the world, did the world react um, strongly enough to that declaration on January the 30th? And did we lose time in scaling up the response uh, at that moment? Uh, at that time, I think uh, we had uh, 100 cases uh, less than 100 cases outside uh, China and no deaths. Can you imagine if I say we have less than 100 cases outside China and no deaths, and then where we are now? <clears throat> so we really do have to look at the opportunities that were lost, potentially, in, 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 in suppressing uh, the disease over time, uh, and we all have to look at that very carefully. But uh, the IHR itself is an important instrument. It's an important way for countries to agree. The other thing, I think, in the IHR is that a lot of the international health regulations is about preparedness uh, and about getting countries ready. And it's within the IHR there are commitments from each country to say how they're going to improve their system. And I think another lesson from this pandemic is that not all countries were ready. In fact, very few countries were really ready to deal with this scale of an emergency. So when this is over, and I'm sure it will be over, um, uh, we're going to have to sit down and not only look at how do we work together internationally in coordinating response, but how do na governments prepare? Uh, and I've said this before, we spend a lot of time protecting our borders from invading armies. Uh, maybe we need to spend a bit more time learning how to prepare our health systems uh, and others for, for epidemics. Can I say something on that? Just to say that I think that um, in the beginning, especially with this declaration of this public health emergency of international concern, which is the highest alert we can, we can raise under international law, as Mike has said. We did see some countries, I, I agree, we need to really strongly look at how countries have responded to that and how they responded to this pandemic. But I do think that in some countries, the ones that I think had direct experience with SARS, yes. the first SARS, mm -hmm. um, countries that had experience with avian influenza outbreaks, mm -hmm. countries that had experience with MERS, and even countries across Africa that have experience with other infectious disease outbreaks, they were at a, in a better state of readiness mm -hmm. for something like COVID than many other countries, including high income countries. And I think that the countries that had that experience, almost that trauma of dealing with something like SARS in 2003, 
knew how serious this was immediately. Um, and so those that acted really fast, acted really aggressively, took uh, a really serious look and, and approach to it, um, fared be better in the beginning. But again, there's a lot to learn. I get a lot of questions right now on the six months, you know, six, six months, seven months in. Um, the biggest question that I have is, are we going to learn enough? Is the world going to learn enough to make changes? And I'm really hopeful that countries will use this as an opportunity to build back better and be better prepared and ready for when and if this happens again. Thank you very much. But I think this was very helpful uh, for, uh, for all our viewers to explain how the IHR works and how we can declare a global emergency. I, I think it's worth as well repeating as we've, we've, if we've been consistent in our um, recommendations, what all of us can do to, to stop the spread of this virus. So I think it's worth mentioning as well, what are the measures on individual level that we can also take to support uh, the response? Yeah, so I think there's a lot that people can do. And I think everyone really needs to understand that they have a role to play. I say this a lot and I will continue to say this because we need everyone on the planet to understand that you have a role to play. Whether you are an adult, whether you are a child, regardless of where you live and whatever type of situation that you're in, you have a role to play. Um, it starts with the basics. It starts with the um, hand hygiene. Clean your hands where you can, when you can, with, with soap and water, with whatever means you have, with alcohol-based rub. Um, physical distancing, so at least a meter apart, um, you know, and this is, you know, at least three and a half feet for those of you who don't use the, the metric system, um, to practice respiratory etiquette. Um, so that means cough or sneeze into your elbow. It means wearing a mask where appropriate. Um, there are specific settings where we encourage the use of a mask where you cannot do physical distancing, where the virus is present. Uh, it includes staying home if you're unwell, contacting the hotline, contacting your medical provider to ask what should you do. Should I get a test? Um, it, it, it means adhering to the recommendations where you live. So in, in situations in certain countries, you're asked to wear a mask, you're asked to stay home, you're asked to follow um, certain uh, uh, rules, please do so, um, because that will help um, break chains of transmission. Um, and it means get involved. You know, find different creative ways in which you can support the response um, by helping, checking in on a loved one, um, checking in on someone. Keep yourself physically distanced, but just check in on people. Um, we have to acknowledge that this not only has an impact on our physical health, but it also has an impact on our medical, on our mental health. Um, and there are many people that are feeling alone. There are many people that are feeling scared. So there's ways we can be kind to one another and, and help. Um, and then there's a whole slew of activities that governments need to do and leaders need to do. Um, and I think we, we've outlined those before. But individuals, really, please be informed, be alert, be aware, um, find good sources of information. Thank you very much, Maria. There's a lot of questions coming in from our viewers, and we are very grateful. Um, I'll start with this one uh, from Twitter. Although many are taking precautions like mask wearing and physical distance and also the lockdown measures, still the virus is spreading. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons I think that the virus uh, is spreading, but the virus likes people. It needs people to pass between. Um, and so where we see transmission occurring, it's between people who are in close contact with one another. Um, in many countries that have had success in bringing the outbreaks under control, um, they're starting to see some resurgence. They're starting to see some outbreaks. And many of these outbreaks are happening in specific settings. So for example, we've seen some outbreaks occurring in nightclubs. Uh, we've seen some outbreaks occurring related to bars and restaurants um, in terms of long-term living facilities. So if the virus has an opportunity to enter those types of situations where you have people coming into contact with one another, very close contact with one another, not practicing the, the hygiene measures and the physical distancing measures and the mask wearing measures that are needed, it will, it will pass between each other. Um, it, we should not allow this virus to transmit between people, and we have some control over that. Thank you, Maria. Here's another question coming from a Facebook viewer. Um, why does some health, national health agencies recommend for people to be six feet apart? We just mentioned WHO recommends at least meter or 3.5 feet. 
So we recommend at least one meter, which is the three and a half, and it, it says at least. So the longer, the further, the better, if that could be done. Um, what we've done is we've been working with a number of scientists across the globe on looking at the distance, looking at how far these droplets will come out of, out, out of an individual's mouth. Uh, we know that physical distancing works. Um, and in situations where you can't do physical distancing, we, we recommend the use of a, of a fabric mask. Um, and just, I should take an opportunity to say that these fabric masks, not all of them are the same. Uh, we recommend fabric masks that have at least three layers and have this filtration um, uh, layer in between, uh, an, an absorbent layer in the beginning and, and a, a re repelling layer on the outside. Um, so it's a combination of factors that we need. Physical distancing alone doesn't work, masks alone don't work. All of these measures need to be used at once. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, Mike, we are receiving um, a lot of questions about hydroxychloroquine and its use in treating COVID-19 patients. What do we know about <coughs> its effects? Um, well, I think the uh, many, many drugs uh, have been tried in this case, and there's been a lot of repurposing of uh, a num number of different therapeutic agents from uses in others. And in fact, we've had hydroxychloroquine as part of our uh, solidarity trials, as have other um, big trials uh, around the world. Uh, what is clear is that while there have been some observations in smaller studies and uh, observational studies that uh, indicated some positive impact, all of the large studies that have been done so far, the ones that have been controlled, randomized trials, have not demonstrated a positive outcome or a, a, an improvement in using uh, hydroxychloroquine in ill patients uh, in terms of improving their outcome. And what's still under study is the use of hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic, as a drug to potentially reduce the chances of you getting sick if you've been exposed or, or, or if you've got mild infection. And we're still waiting for final results on that. But I think it is clear that the, the, the overwhelming medical evidence is that uh, hydroxychloroquine, based on the science and based on the published evidence, does not show a significant impact in improving the outcomes for patients with uh, confirmed COVID-19. But we continue to look. We've seen dexamethasone um, and other drugs show some positive effect, uh, and uh, we will continue to keep open mind. But we, we, what we do have to do is, be, uh, is to do the biggest studies we can in the most controlled way and give the best information that we can to people. And many, many independent agencies around the world have come to that same conclusion. And the other thing we need to be careful with is, like with all drugs or most drugs, they can have side effects. Uh, and certainly uh, hydroxychloroquine is associated with potentially significant side effects and should only ever be taken, uh, especially in the context of COVID-19, under medical supervision. Um, and it is still the, the, obviously the right of any physician to prescribe a drug <coughs> for an indicated drug for, for their patient according to national laws and national guidance. Uh, but all we can say is that at this stage it does not appear that hydroxychloroquine has a benefit in the treatment of sick patients with COVID-19. That goes to your first question that you asked about the science and the speed mm -hmm. of the science. I mean, what Mike was describing, these are randomized controlled trials that are happening in the context of a pandemic. And it's really incredible that these high quality studies are being done and that these results are being available so quickly because we can we can answer questions. This one may not have the, the positive uh, outcome that we would hope for, but still, I mean, the science is happening incredibly fast. And it's just an example uh, of the speed at which th these results are coming out. Yeah, this, this, this was a great one. Um, I'll take another question um, from our viewer, I think, on Facebook. How long a COVID patient remained contagious? Any difference between mild, moderate patients and severe critical patients in terms of duration of transmission? That's a fantastic question, yeah. and it's, it's a fantastic <laughs> question. Um, so, yes, there, we, we are, this is an area of, of active, active research because we know that people can test positive for COVID-19 using these molecular tests, mm -hmm. uh, PCR tests, for quite a long period of time. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're infectious, that they can mm -hmm. transmit the virus to other others. From the data that we have seen, there is a difference between mild patients and severe patients. The data is very limited right now. Uh, we're working with a number of labs who are testing patients systematically, so regularly testing patients over time, which will allow us to not only see if they're PCR positive, but if they can actually grow virus, which means there's viable virus to transmit to others. 
what we know so far is for mild patients, um, there are three or four studies that have shown that um, someone can, can transmit the virus to others for up to eight days, maybe nine days, but they don't identify live virus after nine days or so. There is a difference between severe patients. Um, there's one study, it's in a preprint, um, and the lab shared these results with us um, through one of our international networks and teleconferences, actually two saying that someone who's more ill, someone who's really severe, um, can, we can uh, find live virus from them up to three weeks. But those individuals are in hospital and they're isolated. So there is a difference between mild and severe patients. Um, but we're using this information to help us understand how long someone needs to be isolated for contact purposes, you know, to, to prevent passing it to others. But it's really important that Part of this package that we recommend to countries, which we have from the beginning, is that all cases are isolated. We would like cases to be isolated in a medical facility or a special facility so that they don't have the opportunity to pass to others. Um, there are situations where uh, people who are mild, um, who don't have underlying risk factors, who are under six years old, who can be cared for at home if they're infected. But again, if the virus is in the home, then we have to make sure that they don't pass it to other people. So it's really, really important that all cases are, are identified, even asymptomatic cases, um, because they can also pass the virus to others. Thank you very much, Maria. Here is the, uh, the next question coming from LinkedIn. How will I know that I'm COVID negative after I was positive? You mean after? Do we uh, do patients repeat their tests, or so how do they? How that's do they also a, that's narrative? also a very very good question. So it's linked to the to the first question that I just answered. Questions coming. Yeah, keep keep them going. You're you're, <laughs> you're you're cha you're challenging us, and this is I mean these are some of the most critical questions right now because you know all of these recommendations. I will answer the question, but all of these recommendations that we make. Um, have implications on how countries manage this. You know, they have implications for where pa where patients are treated, um, where they are isolated, and, and and they all have not only a health impact but an economic impact as well. In terms of uh, when someone is negative, uh, in the beginning of this pandemic, we recommended repeated testing, and if somebody somebody had to test negative twice um, within, and they had to have two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. What we've recently done is use the data that I just described to give other recommendations that are not testing based um, to say when someone can be released and is no longer infectious. So what we recommend now is for symptomatic patients, they have to have at least 10 days, they need to be isolated for at least 10 days from the time that they develop symptoms plus an additional three days after symptoms resolve. If you are asymptomatic, it's 10 days from the time you test positive. We have guidance on this and we have a visual that's coming out, um, but it does link back to when someone is, someone is infectious. But again, we're still learning. We're still learning a lot about this virus. As new data becomes available, we will incorporate that into our guidance. Thank you very much, Maria. A few of our viewers on Facebook are asking, is it possible to infect it again with COVID-19 once you already suffered it or not? Another very good question. Um, so what we expect is, and what we are seeing, is that people who are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, this is the virus that causes COVID-19, they develop a, a response, an antibody response, um, which is something that naturally happens after, after any infection. What we're trying to understand is what this antibody response means in terms of immunity, in terms of protecting them against another uh, infection, how strong that antibody response is and for how long it lasts. We don't have a full picture of this yet. Um, we do expect that people will have some protection for some time, um, but again, we don't know how long that will last. Thank you, Maria. Uh, here's the next question. We have one for uh, Dr. Mike Ryan here. Uh, there is one, uh, Dr. Ryan. Oh, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Uh, <laughs> Facebook user says by name, Dr. Ryan. Oh, I'm there we go. I am concerned about the concept of herd immunity. Some mm -hmm. people believe it is better option. What are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, uh, herd immunity is, is a term that's generally reserved for people who work on vaccination and, and because we, we want to try and uh, understand when we're designing or developing vaccines <clears throat> what proportion of the population do we have to vaccinate in order to stop the disease moving. You don't need to vaccinate everybody. Um, 
Um, and in that sense, uh, I think everyone gets that. If, if we're sitting in a room, and I'm in the middle of the room, and everywhere around me is vaccinated, then I'm in some senses protected by a wall of people. And if the next person who has the disease is far away from me, then it's going to take a lot for that disease to move towards me. And that's the concept of herd immunity. What proportion of the population do you need to vaccinate in order for that effect? And that's what it's called uh, the herd immunity effect. It means, in a sense, that you don't have to be perfect in your vaccination campaign in order to achieve disease control. You get an advantage. Uh, and we, for different diseases, that's at different percentages. Mm-hmm. So, in general, for viral diseases, it's probably somewhere between 60, 70, 80 percent. For measles, it's higher because it's very infectious. It spreads very easily and you need a much higher uh, number of people. So, <clears throat> herd immunity is essentially the number of people in the population who are immune to the disease. Mm-hmm. And that's usually achieved by vaccination. This has been somewhat taken into the COVID world, uh, uh, where without the vaccine, people say, well, the number of people who are positive in the community is 5 or 10%. How many people need to be positive in order for us to reach herd immunity? Well, it's, it's a debate. We don't know what that number is. Uh, most scientists will agree that it's somewhere between 60 and 80%. Mm-hmm. Others would think that it could be lower. Um, and we, I won't go into the, uh, the epidemiologic and mathematical details of it, but uh, there are certainly arguments that it could be a little lower. <clears throat> but whatever that number is, we're nowhere close to it, which means this virus has a long way to burn in our communities before we ever reach that. So the idea that we would have herd immunity as an objective, uh, in some senses it goes against controlling the disease because if you if you were to say well we need to have a herd immunity of 70 percent and we should let the virus spread until we get 70 percent we've seen what happens hospitals get overwhelmed a lot of people die Um, and again what we don't realize or we don't understand fully yet and i think it's something we need to understand a lot better and i say this to younger people online there is this perception and it's true that the vast majority of younger people Uh, have a milder version of this disease. But we've seen significant long-term impacts. Yes, they don't die. But we don't fully understand the long-term impacts of this disease. And anyone who's uh, looked at patients who are severe with COVID realize that this is a very severe multi-organ disease that stresses many systems in the body, the cardiovascular system, the neurologic system. And we will have to assume that in milder cases, that similar process may be happening at a milder level. And we don't know what the long-term impacts of that are going to be on people's long-term health. We've seen perfectly healthy young people go to hospital, have a moderate disease, and then come out and find 10, 15 weeks later, they still can't run, they can't exercise, they're out of breath, they're getting coughing um, uh, fits. Uh, Who wants or needs that? So I think we really have to come to grips with, yes, uh, COVID mightn't kill me, but COVID could debilitate you for a significant period of time. And therefore, we have to take it seriously. We have to take protecting ourselves and protecting others seriously. I said it, I think, last week. At some level, we have the right to potentially risk harm to ourselves. We have no right to risk harm to others. Um, and I think we need to, we need to, uh, we need to look at that uh, very, very carefully as well. Thank you, Mike, uh, very much. You mentioned uh, now that... Uh, COVID may um, prevent some people or uh, disable some people to go gym and do some sports for some time. Um, we are receiving a lot of questions from uh, several viewers across platforms about going to gym at the moment. Is it safe to go to gym, gyms uh, and exercise? Some countries are reopening gyms. So what is your opinion on that? I think it's, it's very similar to the arguments that have come up around opening schools or opening other, other uh, venues. When people mix, as Maria has said, the virus likes people. You put people together in closed environment, uh, particularly where they engage in strenuous activity that may involve them producing droplets, heavy breathing, shouting, whatever uh, else. And in that sense, uh, gyms and have been shown in this outbreak to be associated with uh, higher levels of transmission. But, and I say but, because if there's no disease in the community, then the gym is safe. 
So everything about these environments like uh, gyms or bars or nightclubs or anything else, the risk of those environments depends entirely on what is the risk in the community at large. And if you've worked together and if the community have worked together with the government and, and transmission in the community has been suppressed to very low levels, then going back to the gym is fine. And I think uh, <clears throat> when those risks are low, they still need to be managed. And I believe, uh, for example, many, many people who run gyms have a lot of knowledge. They're very, very good at managing safety. Mm. Gyms aren't, are inherently risky places. You're dealing with heavy weights. You're dealing with people who are exercising and stressing their bodies. So people who run and manage gyms are, are, are smart people. They know how to manage risk. They manage the environment they're in. They make that environment as safe as possible for their clients. And adding in COVID management is just another safety measure. Uh, I do, though, think in areas with intense community transmission, uh, gyms are probably, air if I was in that situation, I would probably keep gyms closed. The issue is when communities open up, gyms should open up in the same way, but in a planned uh, and sequential way. But gyms are no more dangerous in a sense than any other environment in which we gather en en masse together, and they need to be managed carefully. But again, I believe with proper professionalism, and compliance from people who use gyms that can be made safe. I think what we're asking Alex is for people to take uh, responsibility themselves for the decisions that they make and the actions that they take forward. So as Mike has said, if the virus is not circulating in an area, things are safer to do. If the virus is circulating in an area, then people need to make a decision, and, and they remain open, individuals need to make a decision. Do I need to go to that nightclub? Do I need to go to that bar? Do I need to go to that gym? And that needs to be an individual level decision. If the virus is circulating, um, if there aren't proper measures in place, then perhaps you should skip. There are other ways that you can exercise. It's really important to stay physically fit, and so there's different things that people can do. They can run outside, or they can do an exercise class in their in their homes and diff in different ways to, to keep physically fit. But not only do the, the, the owners of these establishments need to take precautions, those who are attending these establishments also need to take responsibility because it's not only a matter of protecting themselves, it's a matter of if I go to that gym, if I go to that nightclub, and I happen to get infected, whether it's at the nightclub or it's on the public transport or however it is that you got there, you could bring that virus home and if it doesn't have an impact on you in terms of a severe disease, you could infect a loved one at home. And they could be a parent, they could be a grandparent, they could be somebody who has an underlying condition, and that can have a, a much um, a stronger and more severe effect on them. So we need people to really take responsibility and know what their individual risk is. Thank you very much both. Um, this reminds me as well that uh, later this week, um, mass and populations will uh, gather to celebrate Eid. Um, what is WHO recommendation for such religious and, and social gatherings? Yeah, so this is a great question. And so Friday, you know, people will come together and, and celebrate Eid, um, which is which is wonderful. Uh, what we do for all events is we recommend that uh, a risk-based approach is taken, which means you ask a number of questions, you know, in terms of how the event is held. Is it held indoors? Can it be held outdoors? Can it be held virtually? I know many people who are who are having celebrations, family celebrations, religious celebrations, have been doing these over um, Zoom, over uh, different types of, of different platforms. If that's available, they've been having them outside. Um, there's different. There's there's some fundamentals that need to be taken into account. It's physical distancing, um, limiting the size. Um, limiting the duration of the event if they are decided to take place, making sure that there's hand hy good hand hygiene, um, appropriate food preparation, um, and food safety that's, that's taken into consideration. Um, there's really no reason that people cannot continue to celebrate religious events and, and family events. We just need them to be done in a safe manner, um, and there's ways in, in which that can be done. Again, this is a challenging time for many people, um, but we are finding people be very creative in the ways that they continue to socialize with one another. Um, so we do have guidance out specifically on Eid, um, and we're grateful for our colleagues in EMRO who, who, who've led that. Um, but Eid is a celebration that will continue, and we've just outlined some different ways in which that can be done safely. Thank you very much, Maria. Before we close, because we are running out of time for today, um, Dr. Mike, here is a question as well for you coming from several viewers about the second wave of this pandemic in uh, countries or communities that 
have a success in suppressing this virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of talk at the moment. Uh, people are saying second wave, second peak, and because there's the, there has been this perception that this disease would behave a little bit like influenza, and it would have a natural peak, and then it would disappear for a while, and then it would come back in the northern hemisphere in the autumn. I think we've always said that we didn't know that. Uh, and I think what's become clearer is that when we move to suppress this virus, we put pressure on the virus. It's like uh, when you push, a, those of you who swim, if you take a ball and you push a ball underwater, uh, if you release pressure from the ball, it, it jumps up. And I think this virus is behaving like this. It's like a spring. When we push the virus down, we suppress transmission release pressure, it bounces back up. Now, you can call that a second peak, a second wave. You can call it what you like. What it means to me is this virus requires sustained pressure to reduce transmission and it requires a sustained commitment to reduce exposure. And I think they're the two things we need to do. The government and the authorities need to work to suppress transmission. Stop cases, detect cases, test cases, quarantine contacts. Do all of that work, right? And communities and individuals need to do everything they can to reduce their exposure to the virus. And in countries where we've seen well-managed efforts of the part of government to suppress transmission, and where we've seen communities empowered to reduce their exposure, we see success. Mm -hmm. And we need to see that uh, partnership in countries really improve and really grow. So I would say that uh, there is <coughs> no second wave as such. What we're seeing is the virus naturally re-emerging when we take pressure off. And when people move around, and countries who have done well have opened up their borders and they start, people start to move, then you start to see uh, flare-ups, we call them flare-ups. Now the real question is, uh, how fast do we react to them? And I said this in previous presses. Please don't judge countries and declare failure when all of a sudden there's a two or three clusters in a country after great success. That happens, and that is not a failure on behalf of the country. But please look to what countries do in response to those clusters. And if countries react qu quickly to the cluster, if they investigate the clusters, if they do localized control measures, and if you can see countries reacting in an agile and rapid and systematic way to new clusters of disease, then I think we're going to get into uh, control again. If you see countries ignoring clusters and allowing the disease to get out of control again, then I think we're going to be into what your viewer has said is a second wave. I mean, all we really mean by a second wave is lots more cases. Uh, uh, and uh, we want to avoid that. And I believe it is avoidable. And there are countries demonstrating that you can put this virus back in the box again and again and again. But it takes a huge and sustained effort. And nobody understands more than us how exhausting that is for everybody. I think this is something after seven months we do need to take into account. Everyone is tired. You know, people are just tired of not having their normal lives. Uh, people are afraid because now it's six months. My kids aren't in school and how long is my unemployment going to last or will my employer still keep me on? So this second wave of anxiety too, as people look at the long-term potential for this virus to stick around. Uh, I do think, and this is where I think in, in a crisis, you can either fold and accept your fate and say, well, there's nothing we can do. And you, or you can redouble your efforts and say, look, what we can do things. We need to take control. We need to take action. And I think we need every single individual, every single community. And I would love to see young people do this. I, I, I challenge young people out there. Take control. Take action. This is your world. This is your future. You have the power. We have the knowledge. We know what to do. Uh, and I know it sounds simple. <laughs> but it's hard to achieve. And I really would say we can avoid the second waves. We can avoid this disease going back up and you know, destroying our economies again and, and, over f and or, you know, uh, flooding our hospitals again. But it's going to require each and every person to take control, take action, know your risk, manage your risk, be smart uh, 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 and make a difference. Um, and never before have we needed... Uh, the young people of the world to take notice of that uh, uh, and take action. 
I thank you very much, Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, um, and we thank all our viewers from the UK, France, Canada, Israel, Philippines, Serbia, Paraguay, the USA, Spain, Denmark, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Vietnam, South Africa, Ghana, Ireland, etc., etc. Numerous viewers from all parts of the world. Um, we will be here back next Wednesday to respond more of your questions. Meanwhile, either visit our website for more information or follow our social media channels where we'll be posting regular updates. Thank you and have a good day and stay safe. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.